All right, well, we are in a series based on a book in the New Testament called Romans, and we've titled it Romans. Creative between losing some steam here as we head into summer, I guess. I don't know what happened on that one, but we're calling it Romans. Uh, and I'm really excited about this series because the book of Romans is one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. And not only do I believe it's one of the, my favorite books, but I think it's one of the most influential books as well. Historians agree. One historian called it the heart of the New Testament. Another one said it's the most influential letter that's ever been written. Think about that. Not just Christian letters. Of any letter that's ever been written, he says it's the most influential one. Famous Christians have come to Christ reading the book of Romans. Christians like Augustine, Martin Luther, John Wesley, Justin Bieber. I made up one of those, but I'm just seeing if you're paying attention here. And so our hope in this series is as a church, we would begin to read through the book of Romans together. Now, you can do this on your own. Just pick up the Bible, start reading Romans chapter 1. But if you want a little help with it, download the Eagle Brook app. We've got some Bible reading plans for you. There's also some information on there about the historical background of Romans that will help you understand what you are reading. But our hope is that we would all read through the book of Romans together. Now, each week of this series, we're going to look at a chapter from Romans, and then we're also going to look at a key theological word or concept. Last week, John Alexander did a great job teaching through Romans chapter 1 and the concept of sin. This week, we're going to look at Romans chapter 2, and the theological concept or idea is judgment. It's real light, sin, then judgment. It gets better in the coming weeks. But here's the question I want to ask you today to begin in your life, have you ever felt judged before? My guess is that all of us have. It's not a great feeling, is it? Several years ago, a friend of mine gave me and a couple pastors here at Eagle Brook some twins tickets, but they weren't normal twins tickets, like up in the upper deck or left field. They were for the Champions Club right behind home plate. He was a season ticket holder, wasn't using the tickets. And the Champions Club is amazing. I mean, there, there's free food, there's valet parking, so you don't have to sit in the ramp or wait for traffic. I mean, it's like a little slice of heaven. But to get down there and to carry, to bring with all these guys who are coming, I had to drive my Toyota Sienna minivan, also known as a swagger wagon. And in order to fit all the guys in the car, I had to take out one of my kids' car seats. And then, in a rookie parental mistake, I took out the car seat, and I was in such a hurry, I never wiped off the seat underneath. <laughs> Parents, you know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> underneath that car seat, there's stuff mutating, <laughs> multiplying. I mean, I don't know what's happening under that car seat, but there's a lot going on under there. And so when I picked up these guys to go down to the game, one of them looked at the seat, and he was like, wiping off Cheerios and other things that were caked on there, and he was judging me. I could feel it. I could also hear it because the whole way down to Target Field, the topic of conversation was what a trash heap my car was. Just the day before, to make matters worse, my dashboard lights had gone out. Found out as a computer glitch, but you could not see my speedometer at night. And then that day, my son was playing basketball in the driveway, and a shot ricocheted off the rim with such force, it hit my windshield and knocked my rearview mirror off. So my rearview mirror was dangling by a wire. And it took a lot of skill, because when I was driving and turning, you'd have to duck, because it'd be swinging back and forth. You had to be like a ninja to avoid hitting the rearview mirror. That is the car I drove down to valet parking. When we got done with the game and we went out to get our car, I said to the guy next to me, I'm like, this is going to be hilarious. So the parking attendant, we watched him. He got to my van. He turned it on. He squinted, tried to figure, squint. He's like, man, backs up. Whack! Rear view mirror right in the side of his head. When he got up to me, I said, I'll bet you're not used to driving such a high quality vehicle. I mean, the poor kid, he's used to driving Beamers and Jags. He didn't know what to do with the Swagger Wagon. But here's my question for you. Have you ever had a time in your life where you felt like you didn't fit in? You didn't quite fit in with the valet parking crowd. Or maybe you felt judged by other people in some way. Could be economic kind of judgment. 
You know, they're talking about the fancy steakhouse that they ate at last night, and you're wiping the sauce of Popeye's chicken sandwich off your face. <laughs> Maybe for you, it's your appearance, something about your physical features or how you look that other people tend to judge about you. Maybe you're an athlete, and you frequently deal with criticism, even on a game-by-game -game basis, where people are evaluating you and judging you. Maybe you work at a company and you're one of the only people there that's a follower of Christ. And because of some of your beliefs and some of your values, you felt ostracized or made fun of at times. If you're a middle school student or high school student, I mean, you know what I'm talking about here. You feel judged at times by other students. You feel judged by coaches or teachers. And if you're a coach or teacher, you feel judged by the parents. My point is, no matter what your profession or season of life, all of us at times are going to feel judged by others. So let me ask you, where is that for you right now? Where in your life right now do you feel the most judged? Now, the irony of this is that while we don't like feeling judged by others, we tend to judge other people ourselves. In fact, the most popular verse that non-Christians quote to Christians so this is people who don't really believe in the Bible, read the Bible, but they're now quoting a verse from the Bible to someone who's a follower of Christ. The number one most popular verse in that situation has now become, do not judge. Have you ever had this happen before? Usually it's because one person isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing, and another person comes along and says, hey, I don't think you should be doing that. And all of a sudden, this person over here becomes a biblical scholar. They're like, thou shall not judge. Do thy not know thy scriptures? <laughs> Jesus said, do not judge. And you call yourself a Christian? Years ago, the Barna Research Group did a study where they asked non-Christians what their perception of Christians was. And as you can imagine, it wasn't all positive. In fact, the number one negative comment was Christians are so judgmental. Now, when you dig into the research a little bit, you find that that perception existed in large part because some of the values and beliefs that many followers of Christ hold on controversial topics like abortion, homosexuality, sex before marriage. But it raises for me, I think, an important question. Is it wrong to judge? Now, if you're, you're paying attention, you're like, well, yeah, Jesus said do not judge. So close the book. I mean, of course, yes, it's wrong to judge, but that misses an important distinction. Because when Jesus said, do not judge, what did he mean by the word judge? Did he mean that we should never make judgments? That we should never make judgments about sin or morality or behavior? If that were the case, then teachers couldn't hand out A's or F's. Police officers couldn't hand out tickets. I mean, you should try this sometime. Don't judge me for going 85 and a 45. <laughs> Jesus said, do not judge. Good luck with that. <laughs> Thankfully, when Jesus said, do not judge, he didn't mean that we shouldn't make judgments. We should make judgments when it comes to sin, when it comes to morality, when it comes to behavior and truth. In fact, right after Jesus said, do not judge, Look what he said just a few verses later. If you keep reading in Matthew 7, he says, Don't give dogs what is sacred, and don't cast pearls before swine. Jesus' point here was that there are some people who are so foolish that when you try to give them wisdom, they just trample all over it like swine. But here's my question. How do you know? who the foolish person is, who the swine is, unless you make judgments. Wisdom makes judgments. Wise people make judgments. And so when Jesus said, do not judge, he wasn't meaning that we shouldn't make judgments about sin, behavior, truth, or morality. What was Jesus' meaning? Well, the word that's used in the original Greek here for judge is krino. It's where we get our word criticism from. But Jesus means more than just criticism. He's talking about a superficial sort of criticism. The sort of criticism that devalues another person. 
Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't criticize another person in such a way that devalues who they are. With that as the backdrop, I want to take you to Romans chapter 2. And I want to ask two questions today. And the first one is, what happens when we judge? And the second question is, what happens when God judges? Because they're two different things. When we judge, here's the first result. We pass judgment on ourselves. Romans chapter 2, verse 1, here's where we're going to start. Paul writes this, you therefore have no excuse. Who is he talking to? He says, it's you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. My oldest son has his driving permit, and so we've been doing quite a bit of driving with him. And my wife was coming home from an out-of-town trip, going through Iowa on the freeway. It was a great time for him to get some hours in. But just to be safe, because she was in the passenger seat, going to kind of rest her eyes, she put on the lane departure alert. This is the feature on the car where if you cross over the white line, the car beeps at you. I said to my wife, I said, how did he do? She said, oh, he did great. He did a really good job. But he does tend to drift a little bit to the right, and so the lane departure alert kept beeping. I said, did you talk to him about this? She said, yeah. He just kind of rolled his eyes and said, oh, that feature is so stupid. I hate that thing. And I said, come on. He's got to pay more attention. Driving is a serious deal. The next day, I pulled out of our neighborhood to go to work. And as I was driving, all of a sudden, my car beeped at me. I thought, whoa, what was that? And I realized that my wife had forgotten to turn off the lane departure alert, and I had drifted over a white line. So I did what any sensible father would do. I turned off the lane departure alert. That's a dumb feature. I hate that thing. <laughs> but don't we all do this? When somebody else cuts me off, I am ticked. Oh, who do you think you are? You're so important. Just cut me off. When I cut somebody else off, I'm like, geez, lighten up. <laughs> I have to turn up here. I have to just get over one lane. It's not going to kill you to have one car in front of you. When my wife is crabby and irritable, that's a character flaw. <laughs> when I'm crabby and irritable, I'm tired. Has such a long day at work. When somebody else leaves work early, mm, I don't think they have a very good work ethic. When you leave work early or when I leave work early, we're like, oh, I'm super efficient. I mean, I should sit around chit-chatting all day like everybody else. I actually got my work done. This is more serious than you might think it is. In the next verse, Paul says, now we know. Now, when you read through Romans, you're going to hear these two words, we know. And I think in a world of uncertainty and confusion, it's such a needed letter in our lives from the Bible to go, no, here's some things that you can know. He says, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things, in other words, judge people for things that they do themselves, is based on truth. Let me just pause here for a moment because God judges us. But God's judging of us is different than our judging of other people. See, when I judge other people, I, I don't know the full truth. I don't see the full picture. I only see part of the picture. I don't see everything, but God does. I don't know everything, but God does. And so when God makes judgments, he's not making judgments based on partial truths. God's making judgments based on the fullness of of truth. A couple weeks ago, I was on Twitter, and somebody that I follow on Twitter had liked a tweet by Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy is a Super Bowl winning football coach, well respected, faith filled leader. He's written several books. And the tweet that Tony Dungy had written was about abortion and about the Roe versus Wade conversation that's taking place. But what stuck out to me the most was one of the comments underneath Tony Dungy's post. It stuck out to me so much, I actually took a screenshot of it. I want to show this to you. It's by a guy named BK31. That's his handle on Twitter. 
And he comments this to Tony Dungy. He says, you, Tony, have no right to tell someone else what to do with their life. People want to act like superheroes but don't want the aftermath. How many kids have you adopted and fed, coach? Now, if you're reading the, 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 the conversation here and you kind of understand the context, what he's saying to Tony Dungy is, yeah, you care a lot about life in the womb. But you don't care much about life after the womb because if you did, coach, well, you'd have adopted some kids. You would have fed some kids. What I don't think BK31 was aware of was the fact that Tony Dungy has adopted eight children. Eight. When Tony Dungy was 45 years old, he was the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and he was asked to do a public service announcement to encourage African-American parents to adopt. And his wife came to him and said, how about we do more than a PSA? A month later, they began the process to adopt a one-year-old boy. Tony Dungy was 45 years old at the time. They have not stopped. Since then, they have adopted eight children ranging in ages from 20 to one. These days, they drive around in their conversion van with eight adopted children. Tony Dungy has begun, uh, began a foundation that helps underprivileged children. Kids who don't have fathers or who grow up in difficult situations, they feed them, they educate them, they help pull them out of the life situation that they're in. There's hardly a person on planet Earth who has done more to help kids who are living in underprivileged situations than Tony Dungy. Hey, coach, how many kids have you adopted? Eight. How about you, BK31? <laughs> but before you're too hard on BK31, he's not the only one who does this sort of thing. Because I do it. And we do it. We, we tend to make judgments based on the partial truth that we think that we see. In the next verse, Paul goes on to say this. When you, a mere human being, in other words, don't get it twisted. You're not God. You don't see the fullness of truth. You don't know everything. He says, when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, and we all have our them. Them is whoever we don't like, we disagree with, whatever it might be. And yet, he says, you do the same things. Do you think you will escape God's judgment? We are professionals at seeing other people's sin. We have blindness at times when it comes to our own sin. That's why they're called blind spots. It's a lot easier to point out somebody else's sexual sin. Like, oh, can you believe that? Did you hear about that? Did you see that? Oh, I'm just so bothered by that. It's easier to do that than it is to deal with our own sexual sin. It's easier to point out someone else's temper and anger issues than it is to be self-aware that our own passive-aggressive form of anger is hurting those around us. When it comes to other people's sin, we often act like a judge, or at least I do. When I see someone else, I'm like, guilty. Guilty? Uh, I don't hear it. G guilty. When it comes to my sin, I act like a lawyer. I just present my defense here for you, okay? There, there's a few mitigating circumstances as to why I did what I did. When it comes to other people's sin, we tend to be a judge. When it comes to our own, we tend to be a lawyer. As I was putting together this message, I started to think, what do I want people to get out of this? And as you walk out of church today, well, what is it that I really want people to know and to be able to do? And here's what I came up with. My hope is that you would worry less about how others judge you and you would worry more about how God judges you. For most of us, we do the exact opposite. Most of us go throughout our day and we're worried a lot about how other people judge us. What do they say about me and what do they think about me and what's their perception of me and don't judge me for this. And we're worried a lot about how other people see us and what other people think about us and how they're judging us. Because we want to people please, we want to win their approval, we want to feel good. 
And then, at least for me, I can go days, weeks, months, and I will never consciously think about the fact that one day I'm going to stand before God and he's going to judge me. The Bible says it's appointed once for everyone to die and then to face judgment. Every single one of us is going to die. And when you do, you are going to have to stand before God to give an account of your life. And the question I want to ask you today is, are you ready for that moment? I was talking to a man recently who didn't believe in Jesus, and he didn't have a relationship with, with Jesus. He didn't, wasn't a Christian. And so I said, I kind of knew him a little bit, and so I said, hey, how come? Just, just help me out here. How come? And logically speaking, you would expect him to say, well, I don't think that Jesus resurrected from the dead. I mean, I just don't think that the evidence is strong enough for that or something along those lines. Logically speaking, that's what you would think a person would say. Instead, he looked at me and he said, well, I'm not a Christian because some of the other Christians that I've encountered in my life were mean and judgmental. Now, on the one hand, I empathize with him because I know some mean and judgmental Christians. I also know some incredibly loving, sacrificial, selfless Christians but I also know some that have been mean and judgmental, and so I felt bad. I said, man, I'm so sorry that that's been your only experience with followers of Christ. But I also challenged him a little bit. And I said, you know, one day you and I are going to stand before God, and we are going to have to give an account of our life. And in that moment, I don't think it's going to work to go, God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving me life and breath and all the blessings that you gave to me in life. But I pretty much ignored you. I didn't reciprocate your love. I didn't trust you. I didn't follow you because that guy over there was mean. I just don't think that's going to work. We spend so much time worrying about how other people judge us or worrying about judging other people when really all that matters is that one day God is going to judge us. Paul says when you judge other people for doing the same things that you're doing, you're you're simply inviting judgment upon yourself. Here's the second thing that happens when we judge other people. When we judge, we push people away from God. Here's what it says in Romans 2, verse 4. It says, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. I love this verse. I think about it quite frequently. God's kindness leads to repentance. Couple thoughts about this verse. First, there's a difference between remorse and repentance. Remorse says, oh, I'm sorry I got caught. Repentance says, I'm sorry I've sinned against you and God. Remorse says, I'm sorry I offended you. I'm I'm really sorry you feel that way. Repentance says, will you forgive me? There's a huge difference between remorse and repentance. If there is someone in your life, like your spouse or your kids or your boss, who got caught in a sin, so they didn't confess it, they got caught, You ought to be paying attention. Are they remorseful or are they repentant? I have walked with couples who are dealing with infidelity. And I have watched the person who went outside the marriage repent. And I have watched them be remorseful. The ones who repented, they took responsibility for their sin. But not only that, they changed their behavior. Some of them moved out of neighborhoods. Some of them got different jobs. Some of them turned in phones and computers. Some of them set up accountability so if they ever did it again, they would instantly get caught. They made radical changes to their behavior. They repented. I've also witnessed couples where the person who went outside the marriage was remorseful. And they were crying and they were so upset and they were, you know, just tears coming down their face. I'm so sorry I hurt you this way. And I thought, oh, they get it. And then I realized, but they actually never changed their behaviors. And so a year later, six years later, they went and did it again. Big difference between remorse and repentance. But here's my second observation of this verse. It's God's kindness 
that leads to repentance. If people feel judged by you, they are going to push you away. And by result or association, they may also push God away. If they feel judged by you, they won't want to be around you. It's why Paul says it's God's kindness that leads to repentance. I was on a plane ride recently with my three-year-old daughter. It was just the two of us flying, which was kind of an adventure. But we had a long day. We got up early, and our flight got into Minneapolis late at night, and it was past her bedtime. And so as we were getting off the plane, and we were headed up the gate and the ramp, Anna, my three-year-old, was walking really slow. She was holding onto the bar and just kind of walking up the gate like that. And I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but people getting off planes are not the most patient of people. I mean, this plane in particular, like, we hadn't even gotten to the gate, and seat belts were flying off, and people were fighting to stand up and get their luggage. I mean, we, people wanted to get off this plane. And so I said to Anna, I'm like, hey, stay by daddy. But she didn't stay by daddy. She kept going slow. And I got embarrassed. And I got embarrassed by the people behind me. And so in a real harsh tone, I said, hey, come on, we got to go. And when we got up to the top of the gate, I was adjusting my backpack and kind of fiddling with my luggage. And I looked over and Anna had turned her face. And she wouldn't look at me. And so I got down on one knee and I said, Anna, I am so sorry. Daddy shouldn't have lost his temper like that. Would you forgive me? And then Anna has this little phrase when she feels really close to you. She'll say, you are my best friend and I love you. And so I said to her, Anna, you are my best friend and I love you. And she didn't even say a word to me. She just looked up and she grabbed me and gave me the biggest hug. And then guess what? She stayed right by me. I mean, she was pumping arms and legs. We were passing people, old people, but we were passing people (laughs) in the airport. And I was reminded once again that judgment often doesn't lead to behavioral change. Kindness does. If there's a person in your life, you would love to see them change. You would love to see some behavioral change in them. You'd love to see them come to Christ. What if you show them God's kindness? Sometimes it's always interesting to me that we as followers of Christ expect people who aren't followers of Christ to act like followers of Christ. Like I'll have someone come to me and they'll go, can you believe what that person did? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, because if if I didn't think God was going to judge my life, I'd, I'd be doing the exact same thing. Can you believe what that person said? Can you believe what they think and what they believe? Yeah, I can. Because if I didn't have the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of God within me working on me, well, I would probably believe the same things. I have never yelled someone into the kingdom of God. I have never argued someone into becoming a Christian. I have never posted on social media about a social issue, about why all you other people who disagree with me are so dumb, and had them go, you are right, tell me about Jesus. It's often not judgment that leads people to repentance. Paul says it's God's kindness that leads to repentance. A few weeks ago, we did an all-church survey. And thank you to those of you who took some time to participate in that. We're still tabulating the data, so I haven't seen it. But we did a similar survey last year. And there were 7,000 comments, and I read all 7,000 of them. And that's a pretty vulnerable place to be as a person who teaches, And the overwhelming majority were kind and supportive, and even the suggestions and critiques were very, you know, kindly written. But there was one comment that kind of took me aback. And this person wrote, I I can hardly listen to him, to me, teach because he's so selfish and so arrogant. Now, I'm reading this thought, and my first response was to feel judged. And to think, how do you know that I'm selfish? Like, who wrote this? Do I know this person well? Is this my wife? Maybe it was my wife. I don't know. I should probably ask her, you know? Good way to get some stuff out in the all-church survey. Just let it out. But is this my wife or my kids or my parents? Because otherwise, like, how would anybody else ever know? I could portray myself as a completely selfless person speaking, and then you'd see my real life. and go, actually, not real selfless at all. 
My second response was to feel defensive. I'm like, I'm not arrogant. I'm humble. I'm super humble. I'm like the most humble person I know. Just kidding. My third response was to think she's right. I thought I am be really selfish sometimes. I come home and sometimes I just act like the world revolves around me and here's what I need you to do and here's what you do and it kind of all orbits around me. And I hate that about myself. And I can be very arrogant. I I will think I am so right, and then later on I'll find out I was so wrong. And it's not just selfish and arrogance. If she really knew me, she would find that I have insecurities. She would find that I don't deal with stress real well, and I can get tired and crabby and irritable. I've lied before. When I was younger, I stole things. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. All of those things about me are true. But here's what's also true. I'm forgiven. Not because of who I am or what I've done, but because of who Jesus is and what he's done. That through Jesus' work on the cross, his all-sufficient work on the cross, by shedding his life, by giving up his life for me and for all those who put their faith in him, Jesus says, you are forgiven. And so while all those things that she may think or say about me are true, what's also true is I am a child of God, loved by him, and forgiven by Christ. Maybe today the voice that you hear of judgment is not other people's voices. Maybe it's your own. Maybe you walk around going, oh man, I'm such a bad mom. I failed again. I screwed up again. I'm never going to be able to stop doing this. Maybe the voice of judgment and shame that you hear is your own. My hope in this message is that we would worry less about how other people judge us, that we would even worry less about our own judgments of ourselves, but that we would worry a little bit more about are we living a life pleasing to God? Would you take some time this week and do an inventory of your life, maybe tomorrow or something time in your life where you just sit down for a half hour and go, God, is there anything in me that doesn't please you? Is there anything in my thought life? Is there anything in my heart? Is there anything in my behavior that you are not pleased with God? Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, 5, God's judgment will be revealed. One day we will know what God's judgments of our lives are. And so I want to ask you, are you ready for that day? If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're ready. The Bible says that you will face judgment, but it's a different kind of judgment. The judgment that you experience as a believer is judgment for rewards. It's not for where you're going to spend your eternity. It's judgment for rewards in heaven. But my hope for you today is that you would stop worrying so much what other people think and people pleasing and what their judgments are of you and that you would live your life for his approval alone. But there are others of us here who are going to stand before God one day and we have never put our faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm just telling you that I believe and this verse teaches that without Jesus Christ, you're going to face judgment. There's going to be judgment for your sin. There's going to be judgment for your behavior. There's going to be judgment for just kind of saying, God, I don't really care. And I am praying and hoping for you today that today is your day to say, God, I want to put my faith in you. God, I want to know, not just hope, not just wish, not just cross my fingers. I want to know on that day that I will have your approval. So I want to pray together across all of our campuses as we close today. Would you join me as we pray? Lord, every one of us, gets judged by other people. And for some of us, that's really what's weighing us down right now. It's their criticism. It's their thoughts. It's what they said. God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would set us free, that we would live to please you, that we would live for your approval alone, and that it would be a reminder to us this week when we feel judged or when we even judge ourselves to say, you know what, God, search my heart because what matters is what you think. God, we invite you to do that right now. We invite you to search our heart and search our minds and search our lives to see if there's anything that 
is not pleasing to you. Lord, there are some of us here who have never put their faith in Christ. They're not under your protection, the protection that Christ offers, the eternal life that he offers, the forgiveness that he offers. Right now, God, we put our faith and trust in you. In the quietness of their mind, they're just gonna pray with me, Lord, I confess my sin. I pray that you'd forgive me. I believe that Jesus died so that those who put their faith in him would not face judgment, but instead would have eternal life, that we would receive the love of God, and that when God looks at me one day, he won't see my sin, but he will see the perfect righteousness of Christ. God, I receive that gift right now. God, we love you. We love you that you are a God who judges sin because you love us and you care about us and you are so good that you couldn't judge. But God, you are so loving and caring that you made a way for us through Jesus Christ. And so we celebrate that right now. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, if there's anything that you, if you prayed that prayer, would you text the word begin to 77888? We just have some free resources that we want to put in your hand. Join us next week. Otherwise, have a great weekend, everybody.